most serial killer cases, you're trying to prove that the serial killer in question killed certain people. But in the case I have to cover for you today, that of Henry Lee Lucas, the so-called confession killer, the opposite happened. To this day, they're still trying to prove that he didn't kill all the people that he said he did. The story today is a very complicated one about a man who confessed to hundreds of murders. Some sources say around 250, other sources say 600, others say 3,000. But despite all the confessions, he's only ever been convicted of 11. There were so many cold cases that law enforcement across the USA assigned to Henry Lee Lucas. It was a very easy way to close cases and make themselves look good, and the webs of that are only beginning to be untangled today. How many killers got away with their crimes, maybe went on to commit many, many more, thanks to Lucas's confessions, a lot of which were given to him by law enforcement himself. Yeah, this is a really convoluted story, so get yourselves ready. But first, I want to say a huge thank you to Fiona's Farm for sponsoring this video. Without sponsors, I literally wouldn't be able to keep making content for you guys, so make sure you show all your support. Fiona's Farm is a one-of-a-kind mobile game featuring the perfect balance between quality blast puzzles and captivating adventure gameplay. You have to solve puzzles in order to gain energy to move forward in the adventure, where you're helping Fiona and her grandmother Betty to renovate their family farm. Only, of course, there's also some drama to contend with on the way, including uncovering the mystery of what happened to Fiona's parents. I've been finding myself getting very lost in Fiona's farm over the past few weeks with all of the chaos of the world and chaos of my own life at the moment. It's really nice to have a way to switch off and just have some me time. I love a puzzle game, anything that sort of like exercises my brain and obviously I do also love a mystery. So I found myself having a really hard time putting this game down. Fiona's Farm is completely free to play with no ads, so you can play it without any annoying interruptions. You can download it from the App Store and Google Play, and you can choose to play solo or join a team. Social or not social, the choice is entirely yours. I highly recommend you download Fiona's Farm, it is such a high quality game with hours and hours of fun. You can either use the QR code that's on screen right now, or you can check out the link in the description box and in the comments. So our case today is one that I've had on my list to cover for a really long time. Henry Lee Lucas is a name that's come up in countless videos in the past thanks to his potential involvement. I mean, pretty much any unsolved murder case through the 60s and 70s and early 80s in the USA finds itself linked to him and I can't believe it's taken me so long to finally talk about it. I think I've kind of just been intimidated by the sheer breadth of this story, like where do you even begin with something like this? But as I usually do with my serial killer analyses, analyses, we will start with his childhood. Although to be honest, we don't have loads of information about that childhood. Henry Lee Lucas was born as the youngest of nine children on August 23rd, 1936 to Nellie and Anderson Lucas. The family were very poor. All of them lived in a one room log cabin in Blacksburg, Virginia. Anderson lost both of his legs in a freight train accident at one point, meaning that he was unable to work from that point on. So he just sold pencils on the side of the road. There really wasn't that much money to go around, so the family kind of just survived how they could. Some sources say that they even illegally brewed moonshine in the cabin to sell. But money isn't everything, right? Like Henry had the love of his family. No, of course not. He was neglected and mistreated as far back as he could remember. Now with Lucas, somebody who was known to lie constantly, as you'll come to see, it's really hard to know what you should and shouldn't believe when he's telling you his stories, telling you about his past. But there is reason to believe that what he says about his childhood was true for the most part. I mean, his behaviour had to come from somewhere. His mother Nellie, I think her full name was Viola, but she went by Nellie, was just not a very nice woman. She was both psychologically and physically abusive. A lot of the children, Henry's older siblings, would leave, they'd be sent out to institutions, to relatives, to foster homes, but Henry was never quite so lucky. He would stay at home and would be beaten by his mother on a very regular basis. He would later tell a story of when he was five years old, his mother struck him over the head with a wooden board. So hard that it knocked him out for quite a significant period of time. Sources differ anywhere from 11 hours to three days, but like knocking your kid out for any period of time? Not good, very bad. 
I have talked about serial killers and head injuries more times than I could possibly count, and so Henry Lee Lucas just joins the swathes of awful men who suffered with brain damage as a child. As a result of this, and probably many other beatings, he suffered with both temporal and frontal lobe damage. Your temporal lobe controls your impulse control and your frontal lobe controls your compassion and your empathy. A lack of both those things is a pretty horrifying combination to think about. Well, a combination of both those things and just generally a horrific, horrific childhood. Nellie would literally send her son to school in a dress and ringlets and one day when a teacher gave him some very comfortable shoes to wear, his mother beat him. Like, she was just awful. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. She also reportedly forced him to watch her have sex on a regular basis. She worked as a sex worker. She took on all these regular clients and she would make Henry, her son, watch. And she'd beat him if he refused to do so. She was a very messed up woman to say the least. Coming from an environment like that is going to fuck anyone up. And Anderson, his father, apparently was so sickened by all this with very little power to stop it, that one day he dragged himself outside into the snow and contracted pneumonia and died. Like, that was it. Lucas's deep, deep hatred of his mother is thought to be the source of a lot of his issues. Later on in life, he would talk about how he just hated every single woman. Like, that's why he killed them, he said. He just didn't see women as being worthy of life, all rooting back to the way he was treated by his own mother. He was just violently misogynistic from childhood. And honestly, when you're treated like that by your own mother, can you blame him? I mean, you can, you definitely can. But like, it causes some deep-rooted issues. He was also just generally a bit of a weird kid and he didn't really fit in anywhere he went. Living in such a household, he never would have learned social cues and how to make friends with other kids. He had little chance of education and just never really applied himself in school. His IQ was said to be just 85, which is classified as low average. This was a kid who was given no chance in life. And I don't want anyone to think that I'm sympathizing with him. He grew up to be a killer and there are plenty of poor kids who grew up in very similar situations who turn things around, make the best of themselves, of their lives. But Lucas did not start off on a good foot. He was always going to be at a disadvantage in life. As a young teenager, it's reported that one of his mother's clients introduced him to bestiality and his six sexual fantasies would just begin from there. It's also around this time that he would later confess to committing his first murder at just 14 years old. Although, of course, he would later retract this. He would make these confessions, then he'd take them all back, and that was just his whole thing. In March 1951, a 17-year-old girl called Laura Evelyn Burnsley disappeared from a bus stop in Lynchburg, Virginia. Apparently, he tried to assault her, but she fought back, resulting in him killing her and burying her body in a wooded area near Harrisburg, Virginia. He said that his emotions just took over in the moment, he wasn't thinking clearly, but it's still not known now how true his version of events are, because Laura's body has never been found. When he was 17, Lucas suffered an injury to his left eye. Now, sources, again, differ as to what exactly caused this, as we are dealing with a pathological liar here, but it does seem like his brother and a knife were involved. He ended up needing his eye removed and replaced with a glass eye that left him with this very distinctive appearance, this very droopy eyelid. When you're going to become a serial killer, a very distinctive appearance is probably the last thing you need. Lucas spent his teenage years just in and out of the local jail, and then in 1954, he was caught for a string of burglaries in Richmond, Virginia, and he was sentenced to six years in the Virginia State Prison. After just three years, he actually managed to escape, and he went on the run for three months before being captured and then returned back to prison. After one more failed escape, he was eventually released in 1959 and went to live with his sister in Tecumseh in Michigan, which his mother was not happy with. She tried to make him move back home with her, he refused, and so she followed him to Michigan. A very bad choice for everyone. This is one of those classic cases where his mother clearly hated him, but also they had this weird, like, symbiotic relationship. Like, she couldn't live without him. She needed him there. She needed somebody to abuse. On January 11th, 1960, Lucas and his mother went for a drink at the local bar and they started arguing, as they did very often. She wanted him to return home and he didn't want to. 
Both of them seemed to be very emotionally unstable people. The argument literally went on all night and it turned physical. Nelly hit her son with a broom and he grabbed a knife and stabbed her just right in the neck and she ended up dying. She wasn't found until the next day and by that point, Lucas was long gone, although he immediately became the number one suspect in the murder. He was arrested just five days later in Ohio in what actually seemed to be a bit of a fluke. A state trooper just thought he looked suspicious so they stopped him, according to Lucas's version of events anyway. And then it was found out that he was wanted on a murder charge, so he was taken in. Lucas was pretty quick to confess to this crime, but not only to the murder, also to raping his mother's corpse. He would write in a statement, I had a knife in my hand, but I do not know if the blade was open or closed. I do not know if I got the pocket knife from my pocket or just had it in my hand. When I hit her with the knife, she fell to the floor and I looked at the knife in my hand and the blade was open. But as would become his whole thing later in life, he did recant this statement, saying he thought that she was only injured and he said he was actually on his way back to the crime scene to help her when he was captured. But by this point, five days had passed though, so I don't really know how much he would have helped. Like, why are you going back five days later, not five minutes later? The blood-covered knife and the original confession were enough to prosecute though, although there was argument over whether this should come under a manslaughter or a murder charge, because just how premeditated was this? His attorneys put him on the stand to sort of try and garner some sympathy from the jury. He spoke about how awfully his mother treated him and they even got two of Lucas's siblings to take the stand and share for themselves about their very abusive childhoods. But this didn't exactly help, like it just made him look more guilty because of course he would hate his mum. And in the end, he was found guilty of second degree murder. Apparently he had just no reaction to the sentence of 20 years being sent to Jackson State Penitentiary in Michigan. He'd spend the next decade, the whole of the 60s in prison, serving only half his sentence, where professionals found that he was a very inadequate individual with feelings of insecurity and inferiority. He tried to end his own life twice and so he was sent to a mental health facility from which he was eventually released. But this wouldn't last long though because then he attempted to kidnap two teenage girls, he was arrested again and sent back to the same prison. So he was finally released properly in 1975 at age 39. When he left prison, he was already in a relationship with a woman called Betty Crawford, having connected with her whilst he was still in prison, and they ended up getting married. He moved in with her and her two daughters in December 1975, but just the next year, the relationship would come to an end when Betty accused Henry of molesting her daughters, something we probably all agree did really happen. It's at this point that he becomes a drifter, staying out of the sight of the authorities as he just travelled from town to town. For a while, he just travelled the country alone before going to a soup kitchen in Jacksonville in Florida in 1976, when he met a man called Otis Tall, with whom it said he immediately clicked. Now, Tall is a man I could make a whole episode on in himself. He was a very awful man who kind of met his match in Henry Lee Lucas. Together, they were just this really toxic pairing. If Lucas was a man of low IQ, Otis Tall was even lower. If Lucas was depraved, Tall was even worse. Tall would later claim that him and Lucas had a sexual relationship, like Tall was openly gay, although Lucas never really admitted to as much. By the time the pair met, Tall had already allegedly killed four people and he was a serial arsonist. This was just a man who had no regard for human life and meeting Lucas was probably the worst thing that possibly could have happened. These two depraved souls just coming together. I think about people like Fred and Rose West, about Ian and Myra Hindley, like what are the chances of these people coming together? Upon meeting, the pair very quickly embarked on a journey across the country, living an entirely transient life, and depending on how much you believe, killing in every place they stopped. In 1978, the pair moved in with Tool's mother in Springfield in Florida, which is where they actually ended up staying for quite a while. They worked as roofers. And it's here that Lucas meets Tool's then 11-year-old niece, Frida Powell, although she was known as Becky to everyone. Becky was said to have a mild intellectual disability herself and she lived a very difficult life, having recently escaped from a juvenile detention centre. 
It's said that Becky, again, 11 years old, and Lucas grew close over the years that they were in Florida. Becky was very easily controlled and she had this yearning for friendship. Lucas took advantage of that. He enjoyed having a girl who just doted on him, who hung onto his every single word. She made him feel special in a way that no other woman ever had. I say woman, girl, she was a girl, a child. On top of everything else, Lucas was also a paedophile, although I'm sure he wouldn't have seen it that way. In 1981, when Tor's mother died, the pair were forced to move out of the home and so they went back on the road and this time they took Becky with them. Eventually, Tor and Lucas just went their separate ways but Lucas kept Becky, heading west to Ringgold in Texas, where in 1982 they moved in with an elderly lady called Kate Rich. Now, as far as everyone was aware, Becky and Lucas, who was 45 years old at this point to Becky's 14, were married. They were husband and wife. They weren't, obviously, but that's what they told people. In actuality, child welfare were after Lucas, so the pair had been forced to go on the run. Kate Rich's family, as you can expect, quickly became very suspicious of this very odd couple staying with her. They could see that they were just completely taking advantage. Lucas and Becky were staying there on the basis that they do jobs around the house and the garden, which they just weren't doing. And they were also found to be writing checks on Kate's bank account. No, but the family weren't having that. They kicked them out very quickly. And Lucas and Becky were back out on the road. It's at this point that they met a man called Reuben Moore, a part-time minister who brought them to the House of Prayer in Stoneburg in Texas. This sounds a lot cooler than it was. It was actually just an old abandoned chicken ranch with makeshift living for drifters. The couple quickly settled there, living the married dream. Lucas would later say that this period of his life was the best part of my life. I built myself an apartment there and worked as a roofer on Moore's crew. I bought a car and had what furniture I could buy for the house. I had a TV and stuff like that. But whilst Lucas was very happy, Becky was getting restless. She missed home, she missed Florida, her family, she wanted to go back. And he knew that there was actually a warrant out for his arrest in Florida because he'd stolen a truck there. And he also feared that if they went back to Florida, Becky would leave him. So they argued about this a lot. But it seemed like Lucas conceded. One night in August 1982, Reuben took the pair to a truck stop and said goodbye, not expecting to see them again as Lucas said they were going back to Florida. But just the very next day, Lucas returned to the house of prayer in tears, saying that Becky had abandoned him. She just jumped into a passing truck and left. Spoiler alert, that is not what happened. Becky was never heard from again. And just one month later, Kate Rich, the woman they'd stayed with before the house of prayers, also went missing. And the Montague County Sheriff's Office started an investigation, which did quickly lead them to Henry Lee Lucas. However, he denied any involvement and there's really nothing they could do to pin him down at this point. They didn't have any actual evidence and he passed a polygraph test, so he was just allowed to continue on his way. It wasn't until June 1983 that he was arrested on a weapons charge and lawful possession of a firearm and he was placed in the Montague County Jail. Only this man was an idiot, right? When he was getting arrested, he literally said to the officer, oh, you know about that warrant I have, referring to a warrant he had out in Michigan for a probation violation. And so just more charges were added. They actually didn't know about it and he told them. This was a man who just couldn't seem to shut up. He was somebody who loved talking and hated being ignored. He thrived off of attention. Good or bad, it didn't matter. He just wanted to be noticed. And it's here, I suppose, that the legend of Henry Lee Lucas began. He was completely addicted to coffee and cigarettes. He chain smoked and basically needed caffeine to survive at this point. So after a few days in jail without either of those things, he was beginning to go a little bit mad. He was also being ignored, which he hated. And all of this quickly became enough for him to confess to murder, just for attention. He wrote a note and passed it to the jailer, reading, To whom it may concern, I, Henry Lee Lucas, to try to clear this matter up, I killed Kate Rich on September last year. I have tried to get help so long and no one will help. I have killed for the past 10 years and no one will believe it. He was in for a weapons charge and a probation violation, but he's so desperate for a cigarette that he confessed to murder. And obviously officers jumped straight on this. I mean, they kind of already knew that he was probably guilty of Kate Rich's murder, but they didn't have any evidence. They just had to wait for him to confess and he did. 
In a statement, he would share everything about how three weeks after Becky left, he went and knocked on Kate's door, asking her if she wanted to help him look for Becky. She agreed, and off they went in the car together, heading north. Luca stopped to get a beer and he said it's only at this point that he had the idea of killing Kate, which we can say with almost certainty is a lie because he knows he never picked Kate up with the intention of actually looking for Becky because he knew what had happened to Becky, he knew where she was. Apparently there was a butcher's knife just sitting on the car seat between them and as they drove down a dirt road he described how he grabbed it and stabbed Kate in the side. She died very quickly from a wound to the heart and when he opened the passenger car door she fell out onto the ground and he then described how he sexually abused her body and then dragged her to a large drainage pipe near the road which is where he hid her. And then he just headed out on another one of his road trips going to California but would return a month later to retrieve the remains and head back to the house of prayers where he said he put them in a stove and burned them. After this confession, investigators took him to the area where he alleged all this happened, and sure enough, at the drainage pipe, they did find a pair of broken glasses and a pair of panties. In the stove at the House of Prayer, they did find human bone and burnt flesh. It was undeniable that he was telling the truth, and he was charged with first-degree murder. But that wasn't it, because at the end of his original statement in which he confessed to killing Kate, he also confessed to killing Becky. And this was completely out of the blue, because Becky hadn't been reported as missing, like no one had any idea that she wasn't alive. Lucas had no reason to confess to Becky's murder at this point, but it seems he was just liking the attention. He described how when him and Becky left the House of Prayers that day, they started to hitchhike. They got as far as Denton in Texas, which is sort of just north of Dallas, and they were arguing constantly. Lucas really didn't want to go back to Florida because of the aforementioned warrant, and he said Becky really started to remind him of his mother, especially when she allegedly slapped him. In response, he stabbed her with a meat carving knife that he just so happened to have on him. He said that Becky died very quickly and then once again he sexually abused her body. He would later say this was the best sex he ever had with her, which is just a whole other level of depraved. He described how he dismembered her body into nine pieces and then scattered them around a nearby field before dumping her purse and her suitcase. Two weeks later he said he returned to the scene of the crime and then buried the body parts. After he killed her, he simply cleaned himself up and hitchhiked back to the House of Prayers, no one any wiser as to what had gone on. In what seemed to be an extra stab to the back as well, Lucas would later say that he deeply regretted killing Becky because he truly loved her. Which I think says a lot about this man's very skewed idea of love, I don't think he had the ability to love anyone as other people did. He was very happy to be in a relationship with Becky as long as she was being pliable and easy to control. As soon as she showed wants and needs and minds of her own, he killed her. I don't think that's a coincidence. This is a man who had no regard whatsoever for the lives of women. He would later say that he just genuinely hated every single woman that he came across. Becky's skeletal remains would later be found in the field that Lucas said they would be, and this was a time before DNA testing, so all they could confirm was that this was the remains of a young female, but it was enough to make the confirmation alongside his confession. Once again, Lucas was charged with first degree murder. In June 1983, Lucas appeared in court for his arraignment in Kate's case, which is where he was asked if he understood the charges. He said yes and pled guilty for the crime. And then, in something that would shock every single person in the room, he then said, What are we going to do about the other 100 women I killed? I'm sure you could have audibly heard the gasp in that courtroom. Up to this point, Lucas's crimes hadn't exactly been media worthy, like maybe some local newspapers in Montague County had been covering his crimes and trial, but this wasn't exactly national or even state news. He was just yet another lowlife murderer. And then he made this wild statement, and within days he was national news, probably worldwide news in some places. This wasn't exactly a statement that could be ignored, and I'm sure Lucas knew that. For a man with a famously low IQ, he sure knew how to work the system. Academically, sure, he probably wasn't all that smart, but I suppose you could call it street smarts or maybe self-preservation. 
I don't know. But he knew that being found guilty of murder was just going to result in him being sent to prison and being forgotten about. He wasn't going to get that attention that he craved. But by confessing to murdering 100 people, he knew this was only the beginning, that they weren't going to lock him up and throw away the key. They needed that information. And he was right, like, of course they weren't. Something like this couldn't be ignored. He wrote Otis Tall a four-page letter at this point informing him of his niece's Becky's death and asked him to recall details of all the murders that they'd committed together. He told him that he hadn't yet mentioned his name to the police, although he definitely, definitely had, and said he was going to leave it up to him as to whether or not he wanted to be involved. By this point, Tall was already in prison for another crime and of course, as soon as he received this letter, he was ready to start bragging. Lucas's confessions were already nationwide news by this point that Tall had actually heard and he was raring to get involved, happy to back up any and every confession. He just wanted his name to be there alongside Lucas's. He agreed that him and Lucas had committed over 100 murders together. Now I have no doubt that these two committed murders in the time they were together, like these were two downright horrific people. Do I believe it was as many as they claimed? No. But that's what makes this whole thing so much more complicated, because yes, we do believe they committed murders, but which ones did they commit? When are they telling the truth and when are they lying? These men don't care about being branded killers, they enjoy it, it's what they want. Each death they have attributed to them, they wear as a badge of honour, so how do you sort of sort out the wheat from the chaff? Despite all of this going on, the media frenzy over the murders, Lucas still had to appear in court for Becky's murder. His defence argued that the killing was unintentional this time, that he had acted before he'd really had time to think. He cried on the stand and said that he loved Becky, he didn't want to murder her, he just sort of acted before he thought about it. But yet he still admitted to having sex with her corpse, saying it was just one of those things I guess got to be a part of my life. He was given a second life sentence in prison. But after this second trial, investigators sat Lucas down, gave him a pencil and told him to write details of all the murders that he could remember. Instead, he drew pictures of all the victims, all women, and wrote about how they were killed, what he could remember, and he gave them 77 names or victims in total from 19 different states. As he confessed to more and more murders, they just got increasingly depraved. It would turn out that he had access to phone calls with Tall at this point, who was just egging him on, getting him to elaborate his confessions with worse and worse details. But overall, this kind of just like lessened the credibility of their admissions. They just enjoyed making up these fantasies. They enjoyed showing off to one another. So all of this was happening in Montague County in Texas, but as all of this was happening, a man called Sheriff Jim Boutwell in Jacksonville County in Texas had been investigating a string of murders along the I-35, and upon hearing about Henry Lee Lucas, he became convinced that the murders had been his handiwork. So pretty much as soon as Lucas was convicted of Becky's murder, he was taken to Georgetown in Jacksonville County for questioning. And that's where he'd remain for a very, very long time. As soon as Lucas started making his confessions, there were calls for a task force to be put together by the Texas Rangers. And this would be led by Sheriff Boutwell out of Georgetown. Sheriff Boutwell was an incredibly respected lawman at this time. His word was gospel. He was thought to be one of the best people to run this. As word spread of Lucas's crimes and confessions, law enforcement from all over the country started to get in contact with Boutwell, asking for samples of Lucas's hair, saliva and fingerprints. He set up an interview room with video equipment in which they would interview Lucas for hours on end, asking him for confessions. Lucas would eventually come to call this room his office and he would sit in there and just talk, confession after confession, telling investigators exactly what he thought they wanted to hear. As he shared, the confessions would get increasingly bizarre and unbelievable, but it was in Batwell's best interest to believe what he said. You see, law enforcement officers from all across the country were booking in slots with Lucas in Georgetown. He was fully booked out, as much as eight weeks ahead, he was a booked and busy man. If you were an officer anywhere in the country who had an open murder in your books that perhaps was of a young female, you could go to speak to Henry Lee Lucas and he would confess to it for you. 
Now, I don't know how many of these officers genuinely believed the confessions. If they didn't, it's not like they're going to admit to as much, but it looked good on them to get these old cold cases closed, we filed away as solved. Look what great investigators we are. We solved an old cold case and now we can just forget about it. It said the investigators would turn up to their meetings with Lucas, he'd ask them what they wanted to know, and then he'd just confess to anything and everything. He didn't care, he was in prison for life anyway, he had two life sentences. And that's the thing with Lucas's confessions, is that it was really hard to prove that he didn't commit these murders. He was a roaming killer, he was constantly on the move, and in this time, in a time before smartphones and surveillance like we have nowadays, there's no way to know where he was at what time. For years and years, all he did was just drive and drive and drive with tool. They knew all the back roads, they knew all the secrets of the country. He undeniably hated women, that much was clear to anyone who spoke to him, so it's not out of the question that he'd kill them. According to his confessions, he also didn't have a solid MO. He said he killed by every means possible, apart from poison. So sure, the murders he was confessing to were all wildly different, but that made sense. His MO was that he didn't have an MO. He said he'd do whatever he felt in the moment. Law enforcement officials were urged by some not to believe Lucas if they couldn't confirm the murder for sure, but very, very few of them actually paid attention to that. They just wanted to close their cases because this was the easy way out for them. And they also got the notoriety of like going to talk to Henry Lee Lucas, the guy who was on the front of all the newspapers at this time. It was just this revolving door of law enforcement officers going in to speak to Henry Lee Lucas. He'd say, yep, yeah, I definitely did that one. Tick, done, close, let's go back home. By February 1984, the task force had been able to confirm 47 murders and Henry Lee Lucas was just living his absolute best life. He is a man who grew up in absolute poverty, who was abused his entire childhood, who has ignored his entire adult life. And now here he is in a jail in Georgetown getting all the attention he's ever wanted. Cops were constantly in and out chatting with him, getting him to confess and clear their cases. They treated him like a buddy, like a friend, laughing and joking together. As long as Henry was kept happy, Boutwell said, he was happy to confess. If he wasn't happy, he'd just clam up, so they had to maintain his mood constantly. And luckily, all he needed to be kept happy was a constant supply of coffee and cigarettes. Well, at first at least. As time went on, he started to be given more and more freedom in Georgetown. He was never cuffed in the jail and he could just move around the station as he wished. He knew the codes to get through the doors. He was promised a milkshake for every murder he confessed to. He'd be cooked nice meals on the days he confessed to crimes. You can see why in Lucas's mind, he wouldn't have had any reasons to stop the confessions. He stops confessing, he goes back to sitting in the cell with prison food. He confesses, he gets to chat, he gets to Attention. He gets cigarettes and coffee and milkshakes and good food. They give him access to cable and art supplies. He knew that he'd become an invaluable commodity. He said that Boutwell treated him like a son. It was a no-brainer, really, for both him and for corrupt law enforcement. There were even times in which Lucas would be left alone with case files, crime scene photos and details of the crimes. He'd flick through it, then he'd make his confession, including details of the crime scenes that only the killer would know, impressing the law enforcement officers with details. Then they'd pat themselves on the back for solving a crime. It was truly unbelievable. They'd be like, wow, he knew details about the murder that hadn't been mentioned in the papers. But he was literally being given the case files by the Texas Rangers to browse through before law enforcement came in to get his confession. That's how he knew the details. Lucas would later tell a journalist, I'd go through the files, I'd look through pictures and everything that concerned that murder. And when the detective came from that state or that town, you know, I'd tell them all about that murder. I knew all about the murder. I'd only give them bits and pieces. They didn't care. They wanted to solve it. And when the details of a crime didn't match up, Boutwell would allegedly give him a chance to change his confession until he got it right. They'd asked him to go with them to a crime scene and give him multiple chances to point out the right house or the right area, before then he'd go on a tangent about the murder that allegedly happened there. Everyone must have known what was happening, they must have known it was false to some extent, but no one cared, it looked good on them to solve things, and by this point, they were too far gone, they couldn't now bring things back and be like, oh actually we don't believe him anymore, like they just had to keep going. 
As often happens when killers end up locked away, during his time in jail, Lucas apparently found Jesus. He turned to religion. Because, you know, God will forgive all your sins if you confess and repent. You can still go to heaven, even if you're a serial killer, as long as you say you're sorry. That's how it works. Whilst in jail, he'd become close with a woman called Sister Clemmie, who he would later say was the first woman he ever loved, although I thought that was Becky. And apparently Clemmy taught him all the wonders of Christianity. Jesus one day came to him in his cell and told him to start confessing. And from that day, he said he felt compelled to confess to every single death that he could remember. From that point onwards, the pace really picked up. Law enforcement would literally show him photos of murder victims and he would just say yes or no. Apparently, if Sister Clemmy prompted him to confess to a crime, he'd be more likely to do it. She could apparently convince him to do anything and he thought he was helping, apparently, by confessing to any crime that was put in front of him. If Boutwell wanted Lucas to confess to a crime that he'd said he hadn't done, Boutwell would just go to Clemmy and be like, yo, can you like get him to do this? And she would, he would. I feel very strongly in this case that whilst Lucas was clearly the criminal here for A, maybe committing the crimes or some of the crimes in question, and B, falsely confessing to the crimes, the law enforcement officers from Georgetown and just all across the country were just as responsible for allowing it to happen. The Texas Rangers, they allowed it to happen. So many just took him at face value. He confessed they believed, or at least they pretended to believe to make themselves look good. But there were the cases which it really did seem that Lucas played a hand in, so it kind of just bolstered the law enforcement more to be like, okay, he definitely did this one, so what's to say he didn't do that one? For example, there was the case of 19-year-old Lisa Martini in Kennewick in Washington, whose murder he was able to describe in impressive detail. He described how he'd used a towel to wipe his hand after cutting himself with the murder weapon, and sure enough, there was a bloody towel found at the scene, and after the blood was compared, it was found to be a match to Lucas. It was only in 2001 that they were really able to DNA test this blood though, and they found that it was not a match. A neighbour called King Arthur Bradford was a match instead. Lucas was never actually convicted of this murder, like to convict him of each and every confession was deemed to be just a waste of time, but it was very much believed for a really long time that he was guilty of Lisa's death. He had the details, he had the blood, and it still wasn't him. One of the cases Lucas would become most well known for was that of a Jane Doe who was known only as Orange Socks thanks to the fact that she was wearing, you guessed it, orange socks when her body was found in Georgetown in 1979. Now she was actually identified in August 2019 by the DNA Doe Project as 23-year-old Deborah Jackson who had disappeared from Abilene in Texas in 1977. In 1982 though, Lucas confessed to Deborah's murder, although absolutely no physical evidence existed to prove his involvement. He said they'd met in Oklahoma and they'd had sex, but when he asked her for sex again on the road, she said no and attempted to get out of the car, at which point he killed her and drove her body to Georgetown. He remembered her name apparently as Joni or Judy, which is obviously miles from Deborah, but they wouldn't know her true identity for many, many more years. She was known as Orange Socks throughout this entire thing. He took investigators to the spot where he apparently abandoned Deborah's body, explaining how he dragged her body over the guardrail, but his version of events never quite made sense. Regardless though, he was taken at his word and he was convicted of capital murder in her death. And this marked a big milestone in the Henry Lee Lucas case because this was the first murder for which he could be given the death penalty. And he was. This seems strange to so many people looking closely at this case because when Lucas was confessing to multiple murders for which the death penalty wasn't applicable, it made sense. He was already spending life in prison like more confessions didn't make a difference to him. But to confess yourself into the death penalty? Like, this was thought to be really, really strange. Why else would he do it if he hadn't done it? But at trial, he was convicted and sentenced to death. The defence did say at trial that he had been fed information about this case by questioning law enforcement. They pointed out how when he first confessed to the crime, he didn't really have much to share. But with each passing interview, he somehow had more and more details. And the jury still found him guilty based solely on his confession. 
Lucas would later recant his confession anyway, as he would do with every single murder he ever confessed to, and eventually he stated that the only murder he ever committed was that of his mother. He never ever went back on that one. After this trial, Lucas still wasn't sent to prison or to death row. He was instead returned back to his very comfortable cell at the task force headquarters to just continue with his confessions. And this is where a man called Hugh Ainsworth comes in. Hugh was a journalist who was reported to have witnessed the assassination of JFK and the subsequent capture and arrest of Lee Harvey Oswald, as well as his shooting. He was a very big name in the world of investigative journalism. He'd also spent many, many years interviewing Ted Bundy. So when he heard about Henry Lee Lucas, the so-called confession killer, he was very eager to talk to him. Only it became very clear to Hugh that this was not a killer like Bundy. Lucas didn't have any charm or charisma. He was just a pitiful looking dirt ball with nothing going for him. He stunk, he only had a few teeth left. He wasn't interesting to talk to. And yet he was garnering so much attention. I mean, with each day that was going past, Texas Rangers were announcing more and more deaths attributed to Lucas. Numbers do differ as to exactly how many murders Lucas ended up confessing to. More conservative numbers sit around 300, others 600, some as high as 3,000. I don't really know, it was a lot of cases. Hundreds of cases were closed off the back of his confessions. And even when he later recanted, they were never reopened. That's so many families out there who were given a glimmer of hope, a glimmer of justice, only to have it ripped away and now be left in a worse position than they were before. Because at least before, the cases had been actively open. Now they were closed and just forgotten. Many of these families may have got actual closure. Maybe they'd have found the actual killers further down the line if the cases hadn't been closed. But thanks to Lucas, they were closed, they were forgotten. That was it. In interviews, Lucas was telling Hugh that he hadn't killed Deborah slash Orange Socks, whilst at the same time telling investigators that he had. Hugh found this really intriguing, intriguing enough to actually do some investigation into the murder, something which law enforcement hadn't really bothered doing. And he found that this was impossible. Henry Lucas could not have killed Deborah. One thing about Lucas that we've got to remember is he had an incredible memory. He could remember the smallest details from his life. And he told Hugh that he'd actually been in Jacksonville, Florida at the time Deborah had been murdered. And not only that, he said that he'd cashed a check on the day in question. So Hugh traveled all the way to Jacksonville and found that this was indeed correct. He had cashed a check and he'd been at work mere hours before Deborah had been killed. Jacksonville, Florida is 1,100 miles from Georgetown, Texas. According to Google Maps today, that's a 15 hour drive. There was just no physical way that Lucas could have been responsible. But when sharing this information with Sheriff Boutwell, he didn't believe him. So he took it straight to Lucas's attorneys who believed that Lucas was trying to commit what they called legal suicide. Basically, he knew he'd get the death penalty for Deborah's murder, and that's what he wanted. Lucas would later say himself that it was because he felt so bad for killing Becky that he wanted to die. But if he ended his own life, he wasn't gonna get into heaven. Because again, now he declared himself Christian, he'd been told that he was going to heaven despite the multiple, multiple murders. We know that Lucas wasn't that attached to his own life, regardless of whether you believe his guilt over Becky though. He tried to end his own life multiple times before. It's not out of the question that he actually did want to end his own life. But is it over the guilt? I don't think so. It was the Dallas Times Herald who were the first to share the doubts over Lucas's murders in a front page story on April 14th, 1985. Hugh was able to prove that there were multiple murders that Lucas simply couldn't have been responsible for all down to simple geography. Oftentimes it was proven that he was thousands of miles away. But again, law enforcement just didn't really care. In mid-April 1985, just after this big news broke, the Texas Attorney General Jim Mattox took a closer look at what was going on and called a grand jury to investigate three of the murders. And with Lucas's confessions now being completely discredited, he had no reason to remain in Georgetown, so finally he was sent to death row in Huntsville. 
The investigation into the investigation found pretty much everything I've already shared with you. Investigators feeding Lucas the information, the fact that he was never able to successfully lead them to any murder site, that law enforcement across the country just wanted to get a whole load of old cold cases off their books, lighten their loads. In fact, Lucas couldn't be linked with certainty to any more than three murders, Becky, Kate and his mother. One county sheriff, Weldon Lucas, would later say in an interview for documentary American Justice, once you ask him about a murder, you have to give him a certain location. And if you don't watch out, Henry will have you tell him how it happened, where it happened and when it happened. And then he'll repeat it back to you. He was a nightmare as far as investigators go because he was so street savvy, it's unreal. Which comes back round to his pretty incredible memory. And of course, all of this really threw into question his conviction in the Orange Sox case, and so they gave him a polygraph test. We all know that polygraphs in general aren't to be trusted, but on this occasion it did indicate that he was not responsible for this particular murder. By this point, Lucas and his team were already appealing the conviction, and there was definitely enough there to raise some reasonable doubt. For example, Lucas was convicted of murder and rape in this case, even though there was no evidence that Deborah had been raped. It was also found at autopsy that she had a pretty advanced case of syphilis, and Lucas didn't have it. Surely he would have caught it if they were sleeping together. There were enough questions there. Enough question that eventually, in June 1998, Texas governor at the time, George W. Bush, commuted his death sentence to life imprisonment. So they didn't think he'd done it enough to kill him, but they also weren't entirely sure of his innocence enough to get rid of the charge entirely, so life imprisonment it was. Not that it really would have made a difference though, because he was in prison for life regardless, thanks to his previous murders. In the end, despite his hundreds of conviction, Lucas was only, only actually convicted of 11. His mother, Kate, Becky, Orange Sox slash Deborah Jackson, and multiple more in Texas. 26-year-old Linda Phillips, 18-year-old Lily Pearl Darty, 17-year-old Diana Lynn Bryant, 65-year-old Glenna Bailey Biggers, 26-year-old Laura Marie Purchase, and 16-year-old Laura Jean Donez. He was also convicted of the murder of 30-year-old police officer Clemmy E. Curtis in Huntington, West Virginia, who was handcuffed and shot in the chest with his own revolver. Apart from Deborah Jackson, which we already know he can't have committed, there's not really any clear answers today as whether he was truly guilty of most of these or not. But in regards to police officer Clemmy's murder, it seems like he may have actually done this one. This crime wasn't really on anyone's radar, it was a very specific confession about a cop handcuffed and shot with his own gun near the West Virginia-Kentucky border. When they looked into it, it just so happened to match a real case. That's the only one that nowadays actually seems to be credible out of his true convictions. We know now that he was not guilty of the murder of Laura Purchase as he was ruled out as a suspect by DNA in 2008. In 2021, another man was charged with her murder. There's also question as to Laura Jean Donez as her and Laura Purchase were thought to be part of a pattern of killings in the same area. Both of their murders were incredibly similar. Honestly, this entire investigation was just a shit show. We really don't have the answers that we should. And whilst Lucas was making all of his confessions and getting convicted, Otis Tall is also in prison himself, also making all sorts of wild confessions. In October 1983, Tall had confessed to the murder of six-year-old Adam Walsh. Now this is a very famous case, Adam was abducted from a Sears department store at the Hollywood Mall in Hollywood, Florida in July 1981, with his severed head being found two weeks later in a drainage canal in rural Indian River County. Adam's horrific death became nationwide news, everyone knew Adam's face and name, and his parents fought so hard for justice for their son. His father, John Walsh, would become an outspoken victim's advocate and eventually became the host of TV show America's Most Wanted, helping to solve countless crimes over the years. He dedicated his life to victim advocacy. When Tall confessed Adam's abduction and murder, Lucas fully backed him and his story up, but we know by this point just how little Lucas's word meant. 
We also know though just how depraved of a person Otis Tall was, but we've never had any answers as to how true his claim in Adam Walsh's murder is. A few weeks after Tall confessed, the police were forced to announce that they'd actually lost his car and machete so they couldn't test them, and without them there was no way to prove or disprove his involvement. To this day, nobody knows. In 2008, police officially announced that Tall was the murderer and closed the case, but they didn't have any new evidence. They had no DNA, nothing physical. They were just kind of like, well, he confessed, so it must have been him. John Adams' dad does still believe that Tall was guilty, as well as the whole Walsh family. They're very satisfied that he was the perpetrator, and as long as the family have peace, that's all you can really ask for, right? But we still just don't really know. As all of this is happening, Lucas and Tall are just everywhere. They're on all the newspapers. They were these American boogeymen thought to be responsible for so many crimes. Lucas is probably more well known today, thanks to all of his confessions, but if we're talking depravity, Tall wins. He was truly a monster. It is much more believable to me that he killed many more people than he was convicted for, which was six first degree murder counts in total. He was serving two death sentences plus four life sentences, later commuted to six life with no possibility of parole, and he died of cirrhosis in a Florida prison in 1996 at the age of 49. I can honestly say the world is much better off without that man, but he never provided any more answers as to Adam's death. Although almost all of Lucas's confessions have been discredited or just plain proven false at this point, there are still a few which can't be entirely ruled out, whether it's thought that Lucas was alone or committed them alongside Tall. Although we know that Lucas was fed information by a lot of law enforcement, for some reason these specific cases I'm about to share are listed online as not being able to be entirely dismissed. I'm not 100% sure why these specific ones stand out out of the hundreds, why they think he wasn't fed information in these cases, but we're just going to have to trust the internet. 50 year old Marie Petrie Heiser was discovered dead in a field in Townsend, Delaware in June 1977, having suffered blunt force trauma to the head. At the time, Lucas lived nearby in Elkton, Maryland, and stories he later wrote bore a solid resemblance to the crime scene. 45 year old Stella McLean disappeared from a restaurant in Scotts Bluff, Nebraska in February 1978, with her body being discovered a couple months later in Wyoming. When Lucas was tested as to his involvement in this case, asked very complicated questions about what had happened, he was able to answer every single thing they threw at him. 40 year old Janet Callies was last seen in Grand Island, Nebraska in November 1978. Lucas would confess that himself and Tall had strangled her and buried her body somewhere near the edge of Grand Island and the South Dakota border. He was able to remember very specific details about her life and that's always kind of confused investigators. 19 year old Cheryl Scherer was last seen in Scott City, Missouri and Tall and Lucas both independently confessed to abducting and killing a woman in this area at the time Cheryl vanished. It's been proven that the pair were in the area at the time, although Lucas actually did not recognise a photo of Cheryl when he was shown it. And finally, there's a Jane Doe known as the Grimes County Jane Doe found in Iola in Texas in October 1981. She was found wrapped in a plastic bag and Lucas did confess to this murder, stating that he picked her up in Durham, North Carolina and that her name may have been Cheryl. He successfully led police to the area in which her body had been found, and I think that's one of the only times he ever did that. But to this day, his true involvement in these cases remains a mystery, we just don't know. Lucas remained in prison on death row throughout the 90s until his sentence was commuted in 1998. And of course, he couldn't even just be on death row without attracting attention, without garnering headlines. We all know that serial killers do seem to attract admirers for whatever reason, and Lucas was no exception. Even though he had zero charisma and zero looks, I mean beauty is subjective, but come on, come on. And I have no shame in saying that about him, dude was a serial killer, he killed at least three people. One such admirer of his was a woman called Phyllis Wilcox, and she was particularly odd, even for such a person. She cooked up a plan in October 92, in which she posed as a now grown up Becky, claiming that she'd never been murdered, that she was alive and well. Lucas can now be released from prison. And honestly, for a second there, there were genuinely some people who believed her, despite the fact that she was 15 years older than Becky would have been at this time. Becky, at this point in time, would have still been only 25. Phyllis was like 40. 
And we can't blame Phyllis entirely because Lucas told her that he hadn't killed Becky. So obviously she believed him. He told her that he'd last seen Becky getting into a truck, but told police that he'd killed her so they wouldn't implicate her in the murders he'd already committed. Never mind the fact they'd already found her body in the exact place that he said it would be. Of course, he also denied killing Kate Rich and Orange Socks, but not his mother. He was always pretty insistent that he definitely did do that one, which I think says a lot about his hatred for that woman. You'll be very pleased to hear that no tricks ever released Henry Lee Lucas from prison. Like I said, his sentence was commuted to life imprisonment in 1998, but that life would be short. On March 12th, 2001, Lucas was found dead in his prison cell at the age of 64, the cause later found to be congestive heart failure. And with this, the truth about his crimes died with him, leaving us with many questions still in 2024. There are very much people on both sides of the debate when it comes to Lucas. There are some people who believe he was a pathological liar and attention seeker who only killed three women, only killed three women, but you get what I mean, and that was that. There are those who believe that he was indeed responsible for the murders of hundreds, that in his travels with Tool, it's not unbelievable that he could have killed so many. And then there are those, and I think I'm included in this category, who think the true number lies somewhere in the middle. I think Lucas had the means, he had the lack of impulse control, the temper, the disgusting sexual appetite to have killed many more than just three women, especially when traveling with the depraved tool. Put those two awful men together and there's no doubt they're going to egg each other on. If Lucas could kill his own mother and Becky, allegedly the only woman he ever loved, then I don't think it's unbelievable that he would and could have killed many more women. He had zero emotional connection to them, like why would he not? I would suspect his first few confessions may have had a bit more truth to them, but as he realised the attention he got, the special treatment he got, he may then have started to elaborate and lie. If I was placing bets, I'd put his true victim number maybe around 20, but that is purely a guess. I don't know any more than you do. What I do know is that this was not an innocent man. So coming to today, what about all the cases that were closed and forgotten about because of his confessions? I wish I could tell you they've all been reopened and they've taken another look at them, but they haven't. If I had my way, they'd be starting another task force with the goal of taking a look at every single one of these cases with a fresh set of eyes, having a look at evidence and just forgetting about Henry Lee Lucas entirely. Is there any DNA that we can utilize with today's tech? Like I'd want to get some real answers with a brand new task force. But the truth is the closing of these cases wasn't done on a computer database with great records kept of each and every single one. It's why there isn't a solid number out there of just how many cases were closed because of this. Law enforcement officers from across the country would just book in with Lucas a couple of months in advance, they'd turn up, get their confession, and then just close the case. That was it, forgotten, done, family can be told, case file can be put away forever. Recently, there have been a couple of these cases that have been reopened thanks to DNA evidence, but it's got to be done on a case-by-case -case basis by the local law enforcement. And most police departments aren't going to want to admit to their part in this, they're not going to want to admit to their own fuck-ups. No, it's easier just to move on and focus on the crimes today that are happening right now. There are still so many families out there with questions who at first accepted Lucas as the killer, only now to be left with doubts that are going unanswered, being ignored. The Texas Rangers, who you can argue had the biggest part in this, apart from Lucas, have certainly never admitted their own liability. Even with more proof today of the lies, they're just not asking for things to be reopened. They're just hoping that people forget. Because of Henry Lee Lucas, there are so many questions that remain unanswered for so many people. These cases do need to be reopened. Lucas needs to be forgotten about entirely, and they just need to be reinvestigated with fresh eyes. That's the only way to correct this. But it's not going to happen. It's not worth the time or the money for law enforcement. But with more awareness, though, more people pushing for it, maybe a few agencies might start to do it. Justice was really prevented here for so many people, and it can be corrected, but I don't know if that's a priority. I know it's been a minute since I've covered a serial killer case, but nowadays I only really tend to do them when they're relevant cases that I'm currently covering, and Henry Lee Lucas has come up in so many cases I've covered in the past, I can't believe I've never really looked at this one before. I've just found it a really intimidating case to even begin to cover, like, this is such a huge case. This video could have been four hours long, but I was trying to keep it around an hour.
If you've made it this far into the video, then I think maybe that deserves a thumbs up or a comment down below, some sort of interaction with the video, just to let YouTube know that people are enjoying it and maybe they should push it out to more people. A huge thank you to Fiona's Farm for sponsoring this video today. Like I said, you will find their QR code on screen right now, or the link will be in the description box down below. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next one. Bye guys.